Hey, whether you are here in the room or whether you are joining us online in your home or all over the world, Merry Christmas, everyone. Oh, my word, it's so good to hear the voices of the kids here in the room. Um, what an amazing thing to gather together and celebrate the birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ, which is exactly why we are gathered this evening. And um, I, I, I love the Christmas story, and I may sound a little biased in saying this, but I, I think you should love the Christmas story as well. And of all the different versions that there are of the Christmas story, I like Luke's rendition the best. And of all the different descriptions of what Christmas is ultimately about, I love the way it's described in Luke's account of the story. Um, Listen to how it's described. We're going to be in Luke chapter 2. You can feel free to turn there. The verses are going to go up here on the screen or down there on the screen if you are joining us online. But God sends angels to announce Christmas to a group of nobody shepherds in the first century. And I love the way God chooses to announce the heart of Christmas to these terrified Guys, this is chapter, ten, chapter 2 of Luke, verse number 10. It says, but the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. And here is the good news. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This is how heaven chooses to announce and explain the heart of Christmas to us. Now, I don't know what scrolls across your news feed, but Christmas, apparently, according to heaven, is always and only an announcement of good news. I don't know what heaviness this year has brought for you. I don't know what difficulty has been introduced into your story. I don't know what memories this season conjures up for you. I don't know what fears may be lurking in the shadows in your world. I don't know what report you may have received medically or about somebody in your family or about your job situation. I don't know what kind of news you've been receiving this year. But Christmas is always and only a declaration and an announcement of good news. If you could use some good news in 2020, Christmas is for you. And the angel says Christmas isn't just an announcement of good news. It is good news that causes great Joy. Again, I don't know about you, but it seems like most of the news that we intake and consume these days causes great stress or causes great anxiety or causes great confusion or causes great division, but not Christmas. The Christmas news apparently comes with side effects that may include but are not limited to great joy. A lingering sense of inner happiness. Good news that brings this deep and great sense of delight beyond what we could possibly imagine, beyond what we could possibly conjure up for ourselves. Not the kind of joy that shows up and then it leaves when she breaks up with you. Not the kind of joy that kind of goes up and down depending on what is in the headlines. Not the kind of joy that fades when, you know, the Christmas lights come down. No, great joy. The kind of joy that's greater than a painful year. The kind of joy that's greater than a pandemic. The kind of joy that's greater than the wounds people may inflict on you in relationships. The kind of joy that's greater than a shifting economy. The greater joy that's... 
A joy that's greater than the election results. Great joy. It's a stubborn kind of joy that refuses to go anywhere, even when everything in your world is crumbling and everyone in your world bails out. Great joy. And I'm just saying, if you could use some joy in 2020, Christmas is for you. If you've never experienced great joy before, then heed the announcement of the angels about Christmas because Christmas comes with side effects, one of them being great joy. And this may be the year you begin to experience it. And um, when I say you, by the way, um, I mean you. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter where you've been. It doesn't matter what you have done. According to this angel, apparently, whoever you are, you qualify for great joy. Because my Bible says all people. I love that phrase. All people. If you are a people, this great joy is for you. I don't know what messes or mistakes you've made in your life. And I'm not asking. I don't know how big you think they are. I don't know how people have treated you because of some of the things that you have done. But apparently, Christmas is a reminder that you still qualify for great joy. I don't know how many times in your life you felt like you were just on the outside looking in, excluded from good things. It seems like they happen to everybody else except to you. Heaven tells us that Christmas is a reminder that no, 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 no. Great joy is for you. I don't know what kind of shame you've carried. I don't know what kind of guilt you've lugged around. But the great joy of Christmas is for you. You qualify. So I'm just saying, if you've ever felt too broken or too messed up or too used up to experience happiness, like happiness is for those people who've done good things, Christmas is a reminder there is great joy and you qualify for it regardless of who you are or what you've done. And the angel tells these shepherds, why? Why? And he says, well, because at the heart of Christmas, there is an announcement that the Savior has been born. That's what we've been singing about. That's what we are gathered here to celebrate. That is the ultimate source of the great joy that is available to every single person sitting in this room or sitting in their homes. A savior has been born. This is huge, by the way, because no matter what you think, no matter what you believe, no matter what you feel, what you need more than anything else is a savior. Because no matter what you think or what you feel or what you happen to believe, the greatest thing standing in the way of your greatest joy is your sin. That's not always a fun thing to talk about, but it is the greatest reality. It's our sin. That sin that brings a deep sense of shame. The Bible says our sin separates us from the God who made us and the God we were made to live in relationship with, which means no matter what else we ever find, no matter what else we ever get a hold of, no matter what else we ever do, until that is restored, we will constantly be chasing these little happinesses, but never grabbing onto the lingering joy that is available to us because our sin still stands in the way and we are not good with God. And until that happens, nothing else will bring that deep lingering sense of happiness, great joy. 
It's not found in a thing. As many cool presents as we're all going to open up. I know there's great, great anticipation for that in our home. Great joy is not found in stuff. It's not found in a marriage. It's not found in a promotion. It's not found in an election. It's not found in a comfortable calendar year in which nothing went wrong. No, the greatest joy is found in a savior who can forgive our sin and who can heal our separation from God and who can lift every single ounce of our shame. And I'm just telling you, show me somebody who knows beyond a shadow of a doubt that their sin has been forgiven and the separation with God has been healed and their shame is lifted. I will show you somebody with a defiant version of joy that is not subject to what may be happening in the world around us. Deep and great joy on account of the fact that a savior has been born. And the minute we lose sight of the fact that the deepest joy is our connection to a heavenly father, a year like this will show up and just completely unhinge us. And yet the message of Christmas, a savior has been born who can fix what is wrong at the deepest part and bring the greatest sense of joy. No matter who you are, no matter what you've done, no matter what this year has been like, Christmas is an announcement. The greatest imaginable joy is available to you today because of Jesus. We can sit in this room, you can sit in your home, and we can play all of the cute games that we want. But at the end of the day, the invitation is to great joy. And the question is, are you experiencing it? And if you're not, then Christmas is for you. And might I suggest this is the year. And might I appeal to you, don't miss the great joy that's available to you today. Don't just check off, I went to church on Christmas and I, you know, we tuned in and we, we, we listened to something, we sang some songs, we opened some gifts. Do not, if this is true, do not miss out on the invitation to experience great joy on account of the fact that a savior has been born because it is really easy to miss the joy. Sit in church, but miss the great joy. Know the Christmas story, but miss the great joy. Answer the questions, but miss the great joy. It is really easy to miss the great joy. And might I say it is even easier in a year that has been so challenging. When things are hard, it becomes really easy to lose sight of joy in the person of Jesus and we start to fo focus on fixing the things that have gone wrong. And we start chasing these roads that say, if I can just get that back, if I can just fix this thing, if we can just mend that thing, then we will be reunited with joy. And it becomes really easy to miss the heart of joy because we want to fix all of the things that feel wrong around us. But the angel says, no, it's not because of any of that stuff that you get to experience great joy. It's because a savior has been born. Don't miss Christmas this year, y'all. And if Mary and Joseph, by the way, could speak to us, I feel like they would tell us, oh, don't miss Christmas this year. We almost did. They had every opportunity to miss it. And I'm so thankful they didn't. Let's go back to the start of Luke chapter 2, my favorite version of the Christmas story. Here's what it says. See, because I know some of y'all think like, oh, we've had the hardest year ever. Mm. No one would ever stand to understand the kinds of things that we've... Mm -mm. Watch. Verse number one. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. 
This was the first census that was taken while Quirinius was the governor of Syria. And everyone went to their own town to register. Verse 4, so Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. <laughs> this is how the Christmas story starts. My favorite version, by the way. Um, Caesar Augustus was the ruler of the Roman Empire. Uh, all you need to know about the Roman Empire is uh, they had done this thing <laughs> where they had taken out every other superpower on the planet, making them the only superpower in the world, which means Caesar Augustus was essentially the king of the world. Every single nation that mattered militarily or financially answered and reported to Caesar. This was a powerful dude. Apparently at some point in AD 6, I, I thought Jesus was born in AD 0, but you, anyway, just research it. It's, it's weird. But at some point in AD 6, Caesar decided, I don't think I'm making enough money. I think this would be a great time to make a little more money, to squeeze all of my people for a little more cash. Now, I can't just go out and say, hey, hey, give me more money. What kind of emperor would I seem? So instead, um, let's do a thing where we just make everybody pay us a little more in taxes. And I can imagine as people saying to him, like, there'll be no way to track all of these people down. People live all over the place. How will we know and keep people accountable to the fact that they're paying taxes? And Caesar's like, I have a great idea. A census. Let's make every single person go back to their family's hometown and register. That way we can keep track of everybody and make sure everybody is paying. And with his royal insignia, he signed this into law and it became the global law. Everybody had to do it. And when you're as powerful as Caesar, you get to tell everybody what to do and everybody gets to do it. And that's exactly what happened by this date i want every governor to enforce nobody should be in that town that does not belong to that town we need to track these people down make us some money and everybody cooperated went back to their hometown and i'm just asking can you imagine something like that. Everyone, including Joseph and his nine-month pregnant teenage fiance, Mary. The two of them had to take a grueling three-day, 70-mile trip on a donkey because Caesar had said, everybody go back to your hometown. Ooh. Can you imagine that conversation? Joseph having to break this to, hey, babe, how are you feeling? <laughs> how am I feeling? How do you think I'm feeling? Such a man. Um, I don't know. Maybe that's my house. But um, I'm scared. I, I don't feel ready. I have no idea what to expect when expecting the Messiah. I feel judged. I know people continue to look at us and they don't buy this whole story of God made me pregnant. So things are not feeling great. I feel uncomfortable. I'm not sleeping well. I'm not, I can't see my feet. Like I, I can't move comfortably. I'm not feeling very good. Joseph is like, right. You know what I think will cheer you right up? Road trip. <laughs> this is just terrible. There is no way Joseph would have chosen to do this, let alone to do it to his teenage fiance this close to her due date. Can you imagine what it would have been like <laughs> for Joseph to receive the royal mandate in Nazareth? 
You've got to be kidding me. And can you imagine how angry Joseph might have been realizing this is just some guy trying to squeeze us for more money and he's putting me and my fiance through this for that? This would not have been an enjoyable experience. Come on, let's read the Bible like these are real people who had real feelings. Can you think of a worse time to take a three-day bumpy trip on a donkey? I don't want to risk something going wrong with my pregnancy. Please don't make us do this. I don't want to leave my mom to take a trip. This is the time I've needed her, if ever, in my life. Please don't make us do this. I wonder if they considered, like, you know, just taking their chances and disregarding Caesar. I don't know. This would not have been an enjoyable moment. But what I do know is because it's all the Bible tells us that at the end of whatever they felt or wanted, they chose to take this trip to go and register for some dumb taxes. And then Luke pens one of the most beautiful verses for 2020. This is awesome. Consider memorizing it. It's not long. It says, verse 6, while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. While they were there, the time came. While they were there, heaven said, okay, it's time. It's time for Jesus to be born. It's time for salvation to be introduced into the world. It is time for great joy to make its arrival. While they were there, while they were where? In Bethlehem. Wait, wasn't Bethlehem the place of inconvenience? Wasn't Bethlehem the place they would never have ever chosen to go? Wasn't Bethlehem the place they didn't want it to be? Wasn't Bethlehem the hard place? Wasn't Bethlehem the uncomfortable place? While they were there, heaven said, now is the right time. And great joy was born. Now, something you may not know, and something that, that, that Joseph and Mary may have lost sight of in the midst of all of their personal drama, was that God always planned for Jesus to be born in Bethlehem. 800 years before Luke chapter 2 was Micah chapter 5 verse 2. And this is what it says. God is now speaking. But you, O Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are an insignificant, even inconvenient small town among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be the ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old from ancient times. The plan was always for Jesus to arrive on earth in Bethlehem. <laughs> and I'm just saying, if it were up to Mary and Joseph, they would have been in Nazareth. They were comfortable in Nazareth. Sure, a little drama, but it was still home. They were familiar with Nazareth. Nazareth was what they knew. The only problem, Nazareth was not the place where God planned to introduce great joy into their world. Thankfully, God was so committed to his plan. God was so committed to making sure they got to the place where joy would be introduced. Do you know what he did? <laughs> oh, man. God used Caesar, the most powerful man on the planet, like a little pawn to come up with a mandate that would move Joseph and Mary from what was familiar to the place where God wanted to introduce joy into their world. 
Woo, I love it. Caesar's like, I'm the most powerful guy. And God is like, oh, listen, um, checkmate. Otherwise, I wonder if Joseph and Mary may have just stayed in Nazareth. And I just came to say today, don't miss Christmas this year. Don't miss great joy this year. Don't assume inconvenience and interruption means God ain't just moving us the way he wants us to be so he can introduce joy into our world. Maybe that inconvenience is just an invitation. Time to move. God may be moving you to the place where he plans to introduce joy into your world. See, we're convinced that if I'm comfortable, it means everything's all right. Nazareth was comfortable, y'all. We think we're the first people to feel the frustration of government mandates. We're not that special. Have you considered God might even use government mandates to move you to the place where he wants to lift the weight of your shame that you've been carrying? Don't miss Christmas this year. We think familiar is best, and we like the familiar because we feel in control when it's familiar. We feel self-sufficient. We feel entitled even. We like knowing what's next. You know the problem with familiar and in control and self-sufficient is those are the moments when I least feel the need for the Savior who is the source of the greatest joy. Don't be surprised if God shakes things up. He's so committed to his people experiencing joy that he might just move you. And I'm just wondering if maybe in 2020, while we've been so busy fighting pawns, we've been missing God's plan. God's like, I'm just using this stuff. While we war on it and miss what he might be inviting us to. I can't help but wonder if that's what 2020 has been. God moving his church to a place where we're like, it is so inconvenient and I don't like it and I don't know what to do and I don't know what's next. Let me introduce you to a savior. Let me introduce you to great joy because all of the things you held onto can shake in an instant. But a savior has been born, an unshakable one whose foundations are from the ancient of days and he's still not shaken. Don't miss joy because you're mad about mandates. Forgetting that Caesar is a pawn in God's purpose. You've been so angry, so mad. Don't miss Christmas for that reason. Don't be so busy in the war that you miss where God is taking. You ask God what he might be doing. If that's you and you're frustrated and you're having a Joseph moment, like you're serious, like now? Feels like when it rains, it pours. What is wrong? Just consider asking God, are you doing something? Are you inviting me to something? Are you wanting to introduce me even in this season to great joy? Because the angel announced it's for you. If you don't have it, it's not because heaven is not offering it. Uh, let, me, let me 
to say something here really quickly. Because um, when Mary and Joseph get to, 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 to Bethlehem, it doesn't get any easier. Verse 7 says, and she, Mary, gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. Um, it says there was no guest room available for them. Come on, no guest room was available for them. This just trips me out. Like, wait, so God, you planned for Jesus to be born in Bethlehem, but you forgot to make hotel reservations because there was <laughs> no guest room available for them. Come on, you think your plans have been messed up this year. Can you imagine how hard this would have been for Mary and Joseph? Joseph going from door to door to door, just begging every single person, can you please just give us a room for a night? I'm not telling you she's about to have a baby and she's scared and her mom's not here and, and, and it, we won't be long. Just please, one room. And everywhere they went, they were turned away. Listen, we'll sleep in a pantry. It doesn't really matter to us. And every single place they went, they were turned away. Until finally someone says, hey man, uh, there is space in the animal barn over there, if you're interested. <laughs> and then heaven said, yep, that's the place. What? Do you know how hard we would have worked to avoid a place like that? Heaven's like, that's a spot. Oh. That's not in the text, but I feel like I saw it. Oh, man. I love the Christmas story. And they're in a messy, stinky animal house. Jesus was born. Oh, man. That is where God wanted his son to come into the world. That's where God wanted to introduce the source of greatest joy. I love that. And I might be biased, but I think you should love it too. Jesus was not too proud to be born in a barn. And I can't help but wonder if Jesus didn't choose to be born in a barn so you would know he's not afraid to meet you in your mess. I love the Christmas story. I'm not repelled by the mistakes that you've made or the things that haven't worked out. I'll meet you there. Don't miss the joy of Christmas because your plans fell through and you just can't imagine that God would meet you on plan F. <laughs> Heaven is saying, that's the place, this messy place you feel like you're in right now. That's the spot. No, with so prone to be like, no, Jesus, please meet me at the Holiday Inn. Um, meet me in the hotel, you know, the nice one. Meet me where I feel presentable. And it's like, nope. We're like, meet me in, in 2021 when everything feels a little bit better. And I feel a little more Instagrammable. And while we've been trying to clean up our 2020, Jesus has been trying to break in to meet us in the mess. Don't miss Christmas because it feels messy. Sometimes heaven prefers it that way. I don't want you to think I love you because your plan A is working out. I'll meet you in plan F. The one that feels like you're failing. The mess may be exactly where he wants to meet you. Have you considered inviting him there? Not when things get better, but right now. And I'm just telling you, if you are feeling messy and things are upended and you don't know it, you uniquely qualify. Mary and Joseph would never have chosen this place. They would never have chosen Bethlehem. They would never have chosen the barn. And yet that's where God wanted to meet. 
them. 2020 has been difficult, but God knows how to bring joy into messy places. The question is, will you hear the invitation or will you focus on the inconveniences? Will you accept the offer or will you just keep postponing it until you think like, okay, things are a little bit better. Now let me get back to. Now he wants to meet you in the places that you don't want other people to know because it's just not presentable. So my invitation this Christmas, wherever you happen to be, Christmas is an invitation to great joy. Whoever you happen to be, Christmas is an invitation to great joy. And it's found by coming to a person, the person of Jesus Christ. And saying, would you show me if there's any sin you want to lift? Would you show me if there's any shame you want to remove? Would you show me if there's any way in which I'm standing separated from my God? And would you close the distance? And as that begins to happen, we will start to experience true and lingering joy. The question is, are we willing to come to him and humbly acknowledge this is who we are? And we need him to be exactly who he is. A savior for sinners. So Father, I pray that even now as we sit in this space or sit in our homes, that your spirit will stir us to recognize the ways you may be inviting us into joy, inviting us into forgiveness, inviting us into the lifting of our Shame. May none of us miss it because we are focusing on anything except Jesus who has come to save us no matter who we are. So do your great work in this space. So in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.